National Park is undoubtedly one of Uganda's natural jewels, touched by the very hand of Mother Nature. The park is situated in Chiruhula district in the western part of the country, approximately 240 kilometers west of Kampala by road, making it the closest national park to the capital of Uganda. The name of the lake comes from old folktale told by the locals about two brothers who lived in the big valley. Mburo and Chigarama, as the story goes, lived in harmony until one day Chigarama had a dream. He told his brother about the dream and also insisted that the two had to move. Mburo rejected the proposal and only watched as his brother moved up into the hills. Heavy rains came down shortly afterwards, forming a lake in which Mburo drowned, thus it was named Lake Mburo and the hills close by, Chigarama Hills. Lake Mburo National Park has over 350 bird species, with new ones coming in from Tanzania, as well as zebra, impala, buffalo, waterbuck, leopard, hippo, hyena, topi, ridback, and the shy elusive eland. Giraffes in the park were recently introduced in 2015 with the initial number of 15 animals. Today, the park is home to 25 giraffes as they have thrived and reproduced. Lake Mburo was gazetted in 1933 as a controlled hunting area and upgraded to a game reserve in 1963. The Banyankole Bahima residents continued to graze their cattle in the reserve until it was upgraded to national park status in 1983. As history has it, Obote government's upgrade decision was intended, in part, to weaken the Banyankole who supported anti-Obote rebels. It came at the time of the Operation Bonanza massacre of 300,000 people. As the evicted pastoralists were not compensated for lost grazing land or assisted with resettling, many remained hostile to the upgrade. In 1985, as the second Obote regime was ousted, Previous residents of Lake Mburo reoccupied the park's land, driving out park staff, destroying infrastructure, and killing wildlife. Less than half of the park's original land was eventually regazetted by the National Resistance Movement government in 1986. Given these facts, Lake Mburo National Park is the smallest savanna park in Uganda of the four savanna parks in the country. Over three decades have passed now and Lake Mburu National Park is still home to both wild and domestic life. There is an estimated 2,000 residents living in and around the National Park, but how do these natives coexist with the National Park officials and the wildlife despite the numerous challenges? Life in the National Park can be tough and sometimes dangerous to human life given the conditions. This is a group of cattle herders grazing their cattle near the National Park in Nyombetu sub-county. Agaba Benon, a cattle herder searches for pasture and water for his animals in the same area as the wild animals that include zebras, hippos, hyenas and the elusive leopards from the National Park. Agaba risks losing his livestock to the wild animals as both parties scramble for resources. Only the fit and the brave can survive. Amazi Twenty-four hours. Non-stop. And Zingira yu nyo Ezen sole ziri ente ziri embuzi Zigenda yu nyo We have a, a team The problem animal control team Which is constantly moving around To help the communities in terms of Picking those Those problem animals Out of the communities Either they chase them Or in extreme cases we trap and translocate the herders report cases related to wild animals killing their livestock to the park authorities, but their pleas for compensation have often proven futile. 
kati olaba kati ngente ngente ngezade ne zaya yo eno echiro aka aka kana nota kajayo macho tukasanga the herders face another enormous setback wild animals apparently transmit diseases to their cattle these diseases they say are too complicated to treat compared to other cattle diseases that they are familiar with, thus being forced to sell off their cattle in order to avert the situation. One resident, Bashija Zefania, commends the National Park for conserving the wild animals but besides that, there is no benefit he acknowledges as a community member staying near the game park. Birunji, <laughs> This is Mogisha Elias. He earns his living by grazing goats around the national park and strongly claims that an estimate of three of his animals are devoured by the wild animals on a daily basis. <laughs> He is disgruntled that park authorities are slow to refund anyone whose livestock is killed by the wild animals from the national park. He claims that the park authorities have never put up any fences to prevent the wild animals from crossing over to their land and therefore suggests that the park authorities should visit them and address these issues. <laughs> Every community in this area is governed by a local council three chairperson. Mr. Cavalera Robert, the chairperson for this area, reports such cases to the National Park Authorities, but no solution has been given whatsoever. It is not all well for the herders. However, a few of them are compensated for the loss of their livestock to the wild animals. But even with all these challenges, it is not entirely terrible living in or around the national park. There are a few advantages to it. The herders admit that the park is, for instance, building schools for them in addition to the water dams in the neighboring areas. One case in point is Sarah Parent School. An officer from Uganda Wildlife Authority says the park originally sat on 620 square kilometers, but after some of the land was given to natives for settlement, the park remained on 370 square kilometers. This national park was originally close to 700 square kilometers, so the boundary was the Mbarara Massacre Highway. However, in the mid, mm, late 80s, mid 90s, 
part of the park was regazetted and was given to the community to settle. The Community Conservation Unit of the National Park under its structural plan has an obligation to bridge the gap between the community members and the National Park. The, uh, the community are the same people who are doing fishing on the Kimboro. They're also getting quite, uh, they get their protein from there. So we, we, we deal with the communities and also at the same time within the communities we, we, we work with them on, on different uh, projects. For example, when you go within the park we have the Ankole Cow Conservation Association, Acha, where they are trying to look after the original Ankole cow in a pure breed without mixing it. Because we know that before the black and white came in, or the Muzum cows came in, the Ankole cow did not have many issues with, 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 with the diseases. Now, when they started mixing them, the diseases are becoming more and more, and they are getting issues with uh, the cost of acaricides, where they say the ticks can no longer be killed by the available drugs and so on. So we believe that project, if it multiplies and can provide those uh, original genes back to the communities. <laughs> We also run uh, a spot hunting program under collaborative wildlife management and uh, it, it's operating around this park and they mainly spot hunt animals outside the park. Under spot hunting, they, they hunt only old and mature bulls. They don't go for breeding animals. So if they, if they, if they utilize an animal on your land, you get 40% of the trophy fee. And for example, if it is a buffalo, that means they'll give you $1,000, because a buffalo is 2000 that they pay to spot hunt it. So if they killed it in your, in your, in your land, you receive $1,000, that's your money. There are so many interventions where we want to see wildlife benefiting the local person, so that we transform a problem into an opportunity. Because if, if you can imagine how many cows someone will sell to get $1,000. But this, this is a guy who gets that $1,000 in just one buffalo. Or from a Neeland, he's getting $750. From a zebra, he's getting $150. From an Impala, he's getting $1,000, I mean $150. From a Warthog, he's getting $300. It's, it's beautiful. The National Park works with community members in maintaining the beauty of the National Park as it gives them jobs of clearing selected shrubs and invasive plant species from the game park. At the moment we are doing habitat manipulation, trying to open up the park which was becoming, which was being eaten up by acacia and other shrubs. So we call, we are working with the communities, they come, harvest firewood, go and use it outside. When I get communities that provide for them lunch, provide for them break tea, uh, break porridge, and still I pay them. A few squatters near the park face shortage of food and suffer from illnesses, yet they earn peanuts. Their wage is about $2 for a day's work of clearing shrubs within the national park. Mochungu's Emmanuel stays near the National Park and earns his living by freeing the park from the bondage of invasive and undesirable shrubs and bushes. Mochungu says the wages are too meager to enable him to support his children through school. Katiao, Embera, Ogenda Kumara no Mwaka, Mbutufu, Gubatu, Adoba, Mezu, Gagasiga, Deyo, Ngashitufu, Na Wakanga, Baba, Njurumuba, Kukubira, Ngo, Inuvu, Vunani, Zivanti, Jango, Korechi, Nunga, Tuchisovole, Kubanga, Kati, Nga, Sente, Zetu, Na Zentono, there are areas where we call we, we call them and we pay them. Then there are other small areas which we can get a, like a plot of 100 by 100. Someone comes up and we make with him a temporary agreement and he, he approves it by engaging his own people. <laughs> Asekule Musinguzi, the chief warden for the Community Conservation Unit, says the National Park provides the community with a number of benefits 
adding that the park also serves as a community park. Lake Imburo is more of a community park because it is surrounded by lots of communities and we have a lot of things we share with the communities. The communities are involved in uh, what I would comfortably say co-management of this resource. <laughs> The National Park carries out a revenue sharing scheme where 20% of the total revenue is injected back to the communities in form of infrastructural projects like classroom blocks, water dams and hospitals. We have started a program that uh, we call the Livelihood Improvement uh, Program and uh, this, under this program we are trying to see which enterprise a community can do that will give them income to survive. Justin believes that the policymakers are headed in the right direction towards bridging the gap between natives and the park officials. Um, I would say we are going on the right direction. Um, the community members appreciate uh, to a certain degree, to a certain level. However, there are other complaints that come. And I so believe, I know there is a regulation that is going on. And I, I believe in the policymakers that they are going to bridge the gaps that are existing right now. And I'm seeing a bright future for the national park and the community that lives around it. And the much more appreciation of conserving for generations. This is Ratabala Preparatory School, a Catholic founded school in Sangasab County with about 400 pupils. The national park contributes to schools like these by building classroom blocks and sanitary facilities such as latrines. National Park ya Rekumburu kuya tire centers of revenue sharing ndi azere zo mukagwa rwa barata abatuzi bashara mukombeka aha zikaba zuri miliyoni 53 eza basize kombeka classes ezishoto. The National Park follows a specific criteria when selecting community members who qualify for the livelihood programs. Uh, there's a census that is carried out depending on the population that borders with uh, Lake Mburu National Park. And then after that, all the monies are declared in a big meeting, in a general meeting where all communities are represented. So the communities tell us exactly what their priorities are at the village level. So we go to the parish level and the sub-county council approves the projects that come from the real beneficiaries. So I would say it's on a very level ground that these communities benefit from the national park. From Katwich is in a Nava Turaji, Nava National Park, who sent us to Steam Sahamiz Agakwasakuya and Baba Turaji, Kurimun Gawasakwa and Bukhtagman Batahira National Park, a womb with a womshan. But when Baza you, for example, this dam, to me, I'm looking at it as one of the interventions that would reduce human wildlife conflict. Because now, if the cows have their water here, the, the cows won't enter to go and look for water down and then end up bumping into ainas and all sorts of things. And then we get again a fight. Or these guys get tempted to, when they're going to water, they end up raising. Then again, we, we end up having conflict. So, and if I can refer to the projects from last financial year, specifically in number two, we constructed a four room staff quarter uh, for Nyankumba Community School. And we also constructed a classroom block with an office for Wakobo um, uh, Parent School. And this financial year, actually, next week, we are going to start the construction of a milk shelter with a two-stands VIP latrine for Winshiko. And all those villages are found within number two. Despite a few usual challenges, the chief warden is happy with the relationship the community members have with the park. This caterpillar is being prepared for the construction of a new water dam in a community called
called Sanga Sub County, which is one of the projects being funded under the revenue sharing project. Mr. Tunomitsha, the chairman of Sanga Sub County, an area west of the National Park, is very keen to note that the relationship between the community members and the park is equally beneficial to both parties. <laughs> Constructing water dams in the park is one way of curbing the problem of water shortage during the dry seasons. Whenever there is sunshine, there is no water in there for the communities, in their small community dams. So, and that one creates a lot of friction between us because they end up wanting to go into the park to water the animals and we have to give them the water anyway because that's having Lake Mburo as the main permanent water source, we are obliged to give the communities water. But in order to reduce the impacts of the domestic animals in the park, then we are digging dams like this. However, he says that any community cannot prevail without challenges and calls for more dialogue between the National Park authorities and the natives to continue improving their relationship. We are all aiming at one thing, um, coexistence, and therefore conserving for generations. Because we believe when the communities appreciate the value of the park, he knows that when, when, when a wildlife comes on my land and I keep it and they spot hunt it, I'm going to get money. And when visitors come and we are not poaching and they see a lot of animals, there will be increased amounts of money that is coming in. Then we have the livelihood project Swift succeeds very well. And someone is beginning to see that goat was bought by money from wildlife. Then eventually, wildlife conservation will be meaningful to the local person. The chairperson is very optimistic that in the coming three years, the natives will be more appreciative of the role played by the park as the park officials continue to sensitize the natives about these roles. In spite of the commendable efforts by the Uganda Wildlife Authority to bridge the gap between the communities and the park officials through infrastructure initiatives and the ongoing livelihood programs for the residents, there still persist a few challenges that require critical attention, thus presenting a dire need for more sensitization and different avenues to ensure a harmonious and sustainable relationship between the neighboring communities and Lekumburu National Park. <laughs>